When Lockheed's legendary F-117 Nighthawk first entered service in 1983, it brought with it a revolution in military aviation. After decades of focusing on developing higher and faster flying aircraft to avoid enemy air defenses, the Nighthawk proved that stealth was the future. But before it could do any of that, Lockheed's legendary Skunk Works had to build the Air Force a stealth pole? Let's dive into this. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. I'm back on the road this week, this time at the Army's Drill Sergeant Academy in South Carolina working on a story. So this week's video will be a bit shorter than last week's, but it's one of my favorite aviation stories of all time. But before we dive in, I want to take a quick second to just send my most sincere gratitude to the folks at the Defense Media Awards. Back in May, you may recall me posting a two-video series on just what type of fighter the most advanced aviation technology could field today. Well, earlier this month, the 2022 Defense Media Awards were held in Washington, D.C., and as luck would have it, they selected the written version of that story for Best Military Aviation Coverage of the Year in a joint award with none other than Steve Trimble and Brian Everstein from Aviation Week. Steve Trimble is an incredible journalist who I really admire. In fact, I've cited him a number of times in these videos. So to be given this award alongside him, to be seen in the eyes of others as a peer to Steve Trimble is an honor in and of itself. So I just wanted to say thanks to you guys for watching, thanks to everyone for reading, and thanks to the Defense Media Awards for giving me this incredible honor. But enough of me bragging, let's dive into this story. The radar wicking design leveraged by the Skunk Works for the F-117 may have been uniquely American, but it was actually built upon the collective expertise of a number of scientists and researchers, some of whom even came from the wrong side of the Iron Curtain. As you may already know, the concept that led to stealth was born out of the work of Soviet physicist and mathematician Pyotr Ufimtsev, whose work had gone largely ignored by his own nation before catching the interest of the Skunk Works' Dennis Overholzer. Ufimsev's paper, called The Method of Edge Waves in the Physical Theory of Diffraction, had just been translated by the Air Force's Foreign Technology Division when Overholzer got his hands on it. And to most, this 40-page treatise focused on developing a theory for predicting the scattering of electromagnetic waves seemed like little more than some really dry reading. But to Overholzer, the equations buried deep in the paper represented the holy grail of low-observable aviation. A means to calculate an aircraft design's radar cross-section without having to actually build it and then stick it in front of a radar array. Now, Overholzer worked for a guy named Ben Rich, who ran the Skunk Works for Lockheed Martin at the time, and would go on to write a memoir in 1994 appropriately titled Skunk Works. I'll quote Overholzer according to Rich's memory. Ufimsev has showed us how to create computer software to accurately calculate the radar cross-section of a given configuration, as long as it's in two dimensions. We can break down a plane into thousands of flat triangular shapes, add up their individual radar signatures, and we get a precise total of the radar cross-section. Armed with this new approach to analyzing aircraft designs, Rich's team at Skunk Works set about designing an aircraft with a radar cross-section that was literally thousands of times smaller than the stealthiest platform they'd built to date, which was an SR-71-based drone called the D-21. This effort led to a 10-foot wooden model that the Skunk Works team dubbed the hopeless diamond. Now today, we all recognize stealth as something that really can work and has a lot of value, but that wasn't the case at the time. In fact, the hopeless diamond was stealthy enough that the first real victory it won was a quarter against legendary Lockheed engineer Kelly Johnson, who genuinely believed this ridiculous idea wouldn't pan out. But the bigger hurdle would be convincing the Air Force that their stealth design was the real deal. To test their stealth design, the Skunk Works team brought their hopeless diamond model to McDonnell Douglas's radar test range in the Mojave Desert, and they mounted it atop a 12-foot pole. 
This was a common practice for testing the radar returns of new aircraft designs. But when the radar array was powered on, something seemed to be wrong. The radar operator, manning an array just 1,500 feet from their model, looked to Ben Rich and told him that the hopeless diamond must have fallen off the pole. Rich looked and confirmed that no, their airplane was still there, but it wasn't until a Blackbird landed on top of the model that the operator registered a radar return. Mistaken, he thought the bird must be the aircraft, and as Rich later recounted, that was the first time he felt certain that stealth was a real thing. By March of 1976, it was time for the Skunk Works to prove their design was as stealthy as they claimed to the Air Force. Moving on from the 10-foot hopeless diamond, they arrived at the White Sands radar range with a 38-foot mock-up of their aircraft, made out of wood and painted black. The Skunk Works team wasn't the only one in this fight. They were set to compete against Northrop's stealth design for an Air Force production contract, and the Air Force had brought its most powerful radar arrays to size up each of the firm's entries. With five massive radar antennas, each broadcasting in different frequencies, and all zeroed in on a wooden pole in the tabletop flat test range, Rich's team mounted their model and stepped back waiting to hear how their design would fare against the best radar systems and operators the world had to offer. But all they could see on radar was the pole. According to an account that was later written by Dennis Overholzer himself, the pole registered at minus 20 decibels on radar, which, compared to most aircraft, was basically invisible. But compared to their aircraft, it might as well have been a barn. Now, you might think that being stealthier than what had previously been considered a practically invisible pole in the desert would be a huge win for the Skunk Works team. But it wasn't all good news. I'll quote Overholzer himself. An Air Force colonel confronted me in a fit of pique. Well, he snorted, since you're so damned clever, build us a new pole. I thought, oh, sure, build a tower that's 10 decibels lower than the model. Lots of luck. But you don't make it to Lockheed Skunk Works if you roll over and die easily, and Overholzer had no intention of being beaten by a pole. So he set about designing a double-wedged pylon for the Air Force that was big enough to mount large models on, but created a radar return that was, according to him, just the size of a bumblebee. But there was a significant catch. You see, the Lockheed of 1976 was a far cry from the globe-spanning conglomerate that is Lockheed Martin today, and designing and building a stealth pole for the Air Force was not an anticipated expense for their skunk works. And as we've discussed on this channel time and time again, stealth is not cheap, even if we're just talking about a stationary pole. Now, the Skunk Works may not have had a lot of experience in pole construction, but they did have plenty of experience in aircraft construction. And based on Overholzer's design, they knew ahead of time that it was going to cost a half a million dollars, about 2.6 million today, to build this stealth pole for the Air Force. And the truth was, they didn't have the money. So, keen on getting the competition going again, Lockheed went to their competitors, Northrop, and asked them to split the cost of building what was sure to be the most expensive pole in all of aviation history, probably all of pole history, too. And Northrop agreed, so they got to work building this wedge-shaped pole that would deflect radar in the same manner as the F-117. Of course, this ultimately proved to be a better investment for Lockheed than it was for Northrop at the time. Once construction of the new stealth pole was complete, they set about installing it in the White Sands radar range and powering on the radar arrays to see if it showed any improvement over the previous non-stealth pole. And just as Overholzer had predicted with his design, it was practically invisible to the Air Force's radar. Inside the command post, Overholzer recalled Northrop's program manager looking at the radar screen and whispering to himself, Jesus, if they can do that with a friggin' pole, what can they do with their damned model? Of course, just one year later, Lockheed's Hav Blue would take flight for the first time on its way to changing aviation history forever. Obviously, Northrop's stealth journey didn't end that day in the White Sands radar range either, because just six years after the F-117 that was born out of the Have Blue program entered service, 
Northrop's B-2 Spirit would take flight for the first time, offering a huge leap in capability over even the F-117 Nighthawk. And while Lockheed Martin has continued to dominate the stealth fighter market with the F-22 and F-35, Northrop's follow-up to the B-2, the B-21 Raider, is now set to be unveiled later this year. And while two other firms on the planet now, China's Chengdu with the J-20 Mighty Dragon and Russia's Sukhoi with the Su-57 Felon have fielded stealth platforms of sorts, Northrop remains the only firm on the planet to ever field a stealth bomber. But there is no denying that the Skunk Works victory out in the White Sands Desert was just the first chapter in a long book full of stealth successes, and today, Lockheed Martin's stealth fighters remain the stealthiest and most capable fighters in the world. And it all started with a 40-page Russian document and a half-million-dollar stealth poll. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.